Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm looking forward to our conversation today about using session border controllers to make sure that voice over IP is not a security risk. And uh, actually what you'll hear from me is uh, it it is a security risk, but we can solve that problem. And that's the important part. So here are the topics I want to cover today. I'll spend the majority of my time providing some uh, background and, and hopefully giving you a good understanding of VoIP uh, security threats and actually how we mitigate those security risks. Uh, and then we'll talk about a couple other subjects at the end. All right, let's start with the introduction. Um, basically, we're starting with the, the simple premise that uh, you have voice over IP network connectivity. You have IP connectivity either on the IP access domain shown on the left or on the IP peering domain shown on the right. And on the left, it's because you've got applications that your customers are, have IP PBXs or an IP based contact center or even just IP based clients for unified communications or contact center services that they may purchase from a hosted service provider. Um, so simple example is uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, and so the access domain different than the uh, pairing domain, which is shown on the right. So here the concept is very basic, right? You've migrated TDM trunks to IP trunks. Um, it might be to connect to one IP peer, to multiple IP peers, to connect actually through to uh, UCAS or CCAS providers uh, for traffic you're carrying out there, um, or again, You've implemented VoIP because you have to meet the stir shaken mandate that's coming up in June of 2023. All of these are reasons why you will have IP trunks handling VoIP traffic. And what's the security concerns about that and how do we address those? So let's start with something I think that people would like to uh, better understand and also would prefer not to even have to think about, but it's real, right? Bad actors are out there. They will be making malicious attacks um, because they can, or perhaps they want to get even. They may want to get even with you, a service provider, or with one of your enterprise customers. Um, <clears throat> but the reality is it's more likely they're going to make an attack because they can monetize it. And that's most often done with ransom demands. Uh, I will stop attacking you if you pay me money or other forms of monetization, such as I've hacked an enterprise and I'm selling access to that hacked enterprise services so people can make other free fraudulent uh, service transactions. <clears throat> According to NetScout's threat intelligence report from the second half of 2021, it's now virtually free to use distributed denial of service for higher services. And some of these services will even do a test DDoS attack to prove they can do it. Um, and so bad actors can pay for attacks to take place on their behalf. And then the money they make from the ransom payments or other monetization mechanisms more than offset the cost of actually executing the DDoS attack. So here you have tests that are easy to attacks, excuse me, that are easy to do and <clears throat> not difficult to do for the bad actor and yet they're the ones reaping the benefits. And so it's really important to understand how that happens, why it happens, and more specifically to our conversation today, why it might happen to you, a, a service provider. And according to that same NetScout report, in the second half of 2021, wireline and wireless telecommunications carriers were two of the top three vertical industries that got targeted by DDoS attacks. They point out that uh, one of the high profile DDoS extortion campaigns targeted, and I'm using this in, in quotes, it's their terminology, um, SIP RTP VoIP operators. So that's anybody who's carrying VoIP traffic. And these attacks happened in the UK, in Western Europe and in North America. So it's out there, it's happening and there, you need to be aware of it and how to address it. So what I'm gonna do is put these two points together, that first network diagram, but now I'm gonna add in bad actors. So there's your bad actor on the IP access domain. They might directly attack the communication service provider through that IP access domain, or again, they might be attacking an enterprise customer and through that enterprise customer can fraudulently put traffic on your network or even attack your network. Um, 
on the peering side, right? The threats can come from anywhere through IP peers. And, and that's a big challenge. You don't know where they're gonna come from. Now, I've not shown that bad actor attacking the, uh, through the UCAS or CCAS providers. Um, that's just probably not gonna happen. Oops, I apologize for that. Um, what's more likely gonna happen uh, is they're gonna attack the unified communications or contact center as a service provider themselves directly for gain. They're not likely gonna go through them. However, it's important for you to understand that you're gonna expect those service providers, the UCAS providers and the CCAS providers to have their own security to prevent them from being a conduit to get to you. Again, it's a big picture. You've got to protect yourself. And so, you know, what are you, what are you going to be attacked by? What are those um, threats? Well, let's start by discussing what they might look like and where they're going to occur. And you can see I've put up here the seven layer OSI stack. And what you're going to find is attacks can come from a lot of places. Uh, many attacks especially uh, volumetric attacks, and I'll talk in more detail as we go on that, um, will target the network, transport, or session layers, or possibly multiples of those layers simultaneously. The attacker is going to generally be looking to exploit weaknesses in those protocol specifications and, and weaknesses in implementations of those. And the primary purpose of this is going to be to deplete compute resources that are available on whatever server they're attacking. A couple examples. The most well-known protocol-based attack is something called the SYN flood, and it attacks the transport layer. So it exploits the, the TCP three-way handshake scheme. What it ultimately does is it causes too many TCP connections to be in something called a half-open state. And ultimately, what that means is legitimate actual connection requests can't be handled. Uh, another example of the networking layer is something called an IP fragmentation flood, otherwise known as a teardrop attack. And there, the aim is to saturate the bandwidth and compute resources so they're no longer available to be used for legitimate purposes. Alternatively, you might see attacks at the application layer. Um, and there again, the intent is to take down the application or interrupt the processing of the application layer by exploiting weaknesses in the application in the implementation. So these attacks, again, can be high volume or they can be things like malformed packets. So in, in the case of what we're talking about here, there'll be malformed SIP or RTP packets that have to somehow be handled so that the um, traffic is not disrupted. Um, and then um, the other thing to keep in mind is that bad actors are going to be highly adaptive. They'll modify their attacks and they'll attack at multiple layers. Um, and furthermore, <laughs> the other thing that people really need to keep in mind is any of these attacks can come with associated ransom demands. Uh, increasingly, ransom demands are, are not of the flavor of, um, I've hacked you and I'm going to um, release all your private data. Don't get me wrong, those absolutely still occur. <clears throat> but in this case, I don't even have to hack you. I just have to attack you as a bad actor, cause disruption to your business and say, pay me and I'll stop. And of course, maybe I do, maybe I don't. Maybe I stop and I start again next week. You just don't know if you're being attacked. So there's some serious threats out there. So I wanna take a little closer look at the attributes of a distributed denial of, of service attack that I just mentioned. I, they're going to be multi-layered. We've seen this. They're going to be volumetric. So again, as I mentioned, the intention is to overwhelm the bandwidth with enough malicious traffic to disrupt service or ultimately even cause network elements to fail. Alternatively, um, we're seeing an increasing number of attacks that take place. While it's high volume of traffic, it's not intended to overwhelm, overwhelm bandwidth. It's actually a lot of small packet size packets that are intended to overwhelm the packet processing of the system that's being attacked. Adaptive, I have already mentioned how uh, attacks change during, the tactics change during an attack. Um, I'll give you one example. In late 2021, I, I assume many people know, if not, uh, bandwidth here in the US was attacked. Um, and that attack started out as a brute force network traffic flood. During the attack timeframe, it evolved into a specific volumetric attack 
using UDP, UDP botnets from spoofed addresses. I will touch on that in a bit. And then it changed into a targeted attack with a flood attacking specific VoIP APIs. The bad actors were, were, were overwhelming multiple aspects of bandwidth network and its infrastructure and the applications in an attempt to cause a serious amount of damage. And the last one is coordinated. Um, there was an example earlier in 2021, there were 50 local telecommunication providers in Brazil. They were all attacked with a distributed denial of service attack that started within a three month, three months, excuse me, a three minute window. Um, it was coordinated. It was, it was intended to disrupt network level businesses and, and, and ultimately cause some concern across the industry of, of the weaknesses they had in their security. So bad actors have a lot of tools, a lot of innovation, and um, their goal is to be as successful as they can. And so your goal is going to be to stop that. Um, I do really want to spend a little bit more time on what we're calling a distributed reflective volumetric attack. Um, it's really important to understand these because they're so easy to do. So as I mentioned, these attacks are intended to overwhelm network elements with traffic to the point where they become non-functional. So it starts with the bad actor, shown up there on the top left, spoofing a legitimate IP port address of their target victim. The target victim is shown on the top right. So that would be you, communications provider. And in, that, in your network, the, the target can be any network element. As long as they can spoof the IP port address of that, you're now an attack target. So what happens is the bad actor sends request messages to publicly access, accessible UDP servers. Those servers serve as reflectors. So the request message that's sent could be any number of different protocols, DNS, SNMP, uh, connectionless LDAP, and the attacker spoofs the source IP address, that's your address, <clears throat> with, <coughs> excuse me, they spoof your address and they send these requests to the reflectors. What happens then is the reflectors send the responses back to your network, to the network IP address and port that's been spoofed. The value of this is that the, re the response messages are a significant size bigger than the request payload sizes. So for example, connections, connectionless LDAP responses are 70 times bigger than the request message. Um, there's other protocols that are even larger than that, but it doesn't take a very large number of requests to generate a large number of traffic that's gonna go hit your network. And there's thousands of these types of unsecured, uh, vulnerable UDAP servers, and bad actors can use hundreds or thousands of each of these servers. So it's very easy to generate a huge traffic attack on a network and because the attacker is behind the reflector, it's difficult to identify them and block them. So this is a challenge. This is absolutely a challenge in the industry. It is not just against telecommunications providers. It happens all over the, the world against anyone who's got IP traffic. So it's important to understand that people are very well versed in how to conduct these attacks. They understand how to conduct them, how to make sure that they're successful, and ultimately, it's going to be incumbent upon you to figure out and us to help you figure out how to prevent those attacks, especially as they're coming over IP networks for VoIP services. So with that, let me go ahead and move on. Um, and, and talk instead about what an SBC can do and why it's designed specifically to mitigate these threats. Um, let me start though with next gen firewalls are not equal to session border controllers. So um, I'm assuming that some of you may have uh, implemented, already implemented um, IP trunks um, for VoIP services or already looked at providing IP trunking for data traffic uh, and it may already have a next generation firewall in your network. Um, again, they're great for data traffic. They're not so good for VoIP traffic. And there's a couple of reasons why. 
Um, most importantly, they have limited functionality when it comes to the application content, specifically VoIP. They're not uh, VoIP session aware. They don't know when a VoIP call is terminated. So often what we find is the media that's associated with a VoIP call, the ports that are associated for that media are left open, leaving a potential gap. Um, they don't know how to handle VoIP sessions or encryption for VoIP services. So the next gen firewall can provide value at the IP layer and perhaps even stop some of those DDoS attacks at the IP layer, but it can't do anything about the VoIP traffic that may be associated with those DDoS attacks, or if those DDoS attacks are again on the VoIP network equipment. So you need a session border control, plain and simple, that's the position that we believe is important. So now I'm gonna come back to my network diagram, and I've now overlaid session border controllers on both the access and peering domain. So the SBCs and SBC, a ribbon SBC, can address both the IP access and the peering domain and do it for both signaling and media traffic. Now, again, depending upon your network, your network size, your traffic, uh, there may be some slightly different requirements of what that SBC has to do in these two different domains. But again, the SBC itself has been built to cover all of your IP interconnects and all of the VoIP traffic running over it. So I wanna just basically benchmark an SBC. Uh, it's purposely built to deal with VoIP traffic, to deal with SIP and RTP and intelligently manage that traffic. It's a demarcation point and it's a traffic cop providing intelligent section and layer uh, management for real-time communications. So an SBC will simply put dynamically identify, monitor, alarm, deprioritize, discard or ultimately ban malicious sources of data on the fly in real time without any operator interaction yes you certainly have to configure them yes you want to make sure they're working properly but the sbc is intended to do everything in real time and secure your real-time communications without somebody having to go oh i should change something so <clears throat> Let's talk a bit more in detail about what that is. So as a demarcation point, a back-to-back -back user agent is the term that's used. It terminates, inspects, and re-originates the SIP sessions. So SIP messages are coming in to an SBC. That session is terminated, it's inspected, and re-originated, and moved on into the inside of the network. Right, and vice versa for traffic leaving the network and going outbound. So that provides network topology hiding. That means that because the SBC is translating IP address and ports for signaling and media, it's hiding the internal core network addressing, the schemes, translations, network topology itself. This is incredibly crucial to stopping bad actors from getting in and finding out VoIP network infrastructure points that they can attack. Uh, SBCs support transport layer security for signaling. So we're supporting peer authentication, confidentiality, and message integrity. We're supporting IPsec, uh, internet protocol security for signaling as well, supporting cryptographic protection for non-media IP packets, that's the SIP signaling, uh, using management or packet interfaces, and then secure RTP for the media. And the, uh, the point I wanna raise on that is, if you have a call that has multiple legs in that call, the SRTP can be done independently for each leg of the call. As a policy enforcement point, the SBT, SBC is going to manage packet flows and traffic conditions against things like the denial of service attacks I just talked about, whether that attack is against the SBC itself or against the VoIP infrastructure behind it. Now, with back-to-back -back user agent, you, it shouldn't be seeing the VoIP infrastructure behind the SBC. Um, but again, if you don't have the SBC or it's not properly configured or something else, it is possible for that to be exposed. And that's certainly don't want that to happen. And again, it handles this for both SIP signaling and for RTP. So the SBC is the intermediary and without it, you're exposed. 
Um, so I, I want to get again a bit more into detail. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully moving you down this path of a little more information that will be useful for you in your, in your understanding of what an SBC is going to provide. But to protect that signaling, <clears throat> the SBC is going to use IP access control list policing. Again, that happens with a next-gen firewall on data services. SBC is using something similar. The goal is to only admit packets from known sources and apply rate limiting as needed. So I don't want traffic coming in from a source I don't know. I want to stop it. Um, I want a dynamic block list that allows me to auto-detect and block non-conforming SIP endpoints. I want something called microflow and priority where aggregate packet policing. That's a mouthful, I realize. Um, and what that is, is it's the ability to rate limit SIP signaling packets based at a very detailed level to protect the SBC itself or the VoIP infrastructure behind it. I'll cover that in a bit more detail in a, in a few slides. And similarly for media, for the RTP packets, you wanna be as, as provide as much policing as possible. So the SBC is gonna detect rogue media packets, discard packets that are not part of a currently established SIP session. So the SDP, the information that's exchanged about the RTP session packets is going to say, wait, this doesn't belong, right? I'm gonna get rid of it. Um, I'm gonna apply rate limiting on a bytes per second granularity based on whatever codecs and packetization times are, have been negotiated. I'm going to validate RTP source IP addresses, um, port and IP addresses against what was signaled in that SDP. So again, the idea that says I'm going to be able to prevent against DDoS attacks because the packet information I'm receiving is got different information in it than the packet information that was negotiated for this session. So there's important ways the SBC has been built to stop these threats that I've been talking about. So I'll show you what this looks like on the two interfaces, uh, on the network to network interface side for peering, and then on the next slide on the IP access side. So here's your SPC on the, on the image on the top right, um, and that's got peering connections to peers A, B, and C, or A, B, and X, excuse me. And as you can see on the box below, there's some rules and precedences. Those are how things are, are um, processed to allow packets in or out. So as the bullets show on the left and what we learned from these reflective DDoS attacks is we want to make sure that the SBC and its compute resources are only minimally being used for processing by discarding these denial of service packets as early as possible in the logic. Meaning we don't want a lot of traffic coming in and have to process all those packets just to decide what to do with them. So we, we, again, we want to use these IP access control lists um, we want to rate limit them to defend against potential uh, abuse by overload conditions. And what you can see on the right hand side, um, rule one, precedent one, action says allow. So here's a peer A, and it has a source IP address for an SBC SIP IP address in my network as the destination IP. And that's my address, and it's legitimate. I'm going to use it, or I'm going to allow it, right? There's possibilities for multiple things to, to set precedence and rules on. But the other thing that happens sometimes is I don't necessarily receive packets from IP addresses I, I know that are destined for my network, right? So I can confirm or I can learn unknown IP addresses and, and tag them or identify them as, as trusted after I receive and process a limited number of SIP requests and responses. So I want to actually go ahead and process them as few as possible to reach a threshold where I say, yes, this looks like it's legitimate traffic. And I want to go ahead and use it or allow it is probably a better way to put it. Um, same thing is going to happen on RTP packets, right? We want to ensure that the RTP packets are coming from a valid destination into our network. And finally, Ribbon always recommends our customers use TCP instead of UDP, uh, especially because TCP-based reflector attacks are very rare. The ones I discussed earlier are based on UDP. Um, and in conjunction, we also have uh, a specific 
hardened Linux TCP IP stack that we use that actually has schema in it that will protect against those TCP SIM flood attacks that I said were very common. So again, we know what the attacks are. We've built processes to understand how to mitigate those attacks. We've built processes to make sure that we can do the, handle those attacks and still handle legitimate traffic without any degradation in processes. All right, on the other side, on the, on the IP access side, <coughs> Um, we have multiple things that we've built and we want to use that are going to secure this side as well, again, from DDoS attacks or other attacks. So the section on the left is showing you something called microflow policing. So we're enforcing a per endpoint packet rate limit and we're auto managing what those packets are based on the registration states. So we're implying, we're applying intelligence to what the traffic we should be seeing and treating it accordingly. Now that's the stage one on the left. Stage two, aggregate policing is on the right. And it's a second stage where we take the packets that are admitted to that first stage. And then we use prioritization schemas to determine if the packet is desirable or not. So it's a very specific example. If a packet came in on a authenticated microflow. So on the left-hand side, I said, this is packets coming from somebody I know, they're trusted, then I'm going to give them a higher priority. So when all the packets are being managed, shown on the right, they're gonna get a higher priority. So if for some reason something gets through that it shouldn't on the second stage of policing, it's still gonna get a lower priority than the packets I know and want to process first. So this allows authenticated devices to place and receive calls and, and refresh registrations, for example, even when DDoS attacks are happening. So I'm purposely giving priority to the traffic I believe is the right traffic to handle first. Again, another way to ensure that your network is, is going to perform better than not, even under a, a, an attack from a bad actor. All right, so I've, I've gone on quite a bit on uh, the demarcation point and the value there. And I've mentioned intelligence session control and I've listed four um, items here, protocol normalization, uh, knowledge of SIP state, um, managing specific application overload conditions, uh, and specifically things, for example, like call admission control. Um, those are not strictly security aspects, but they are related traffic cop functions, as I mentioned before. And they're critical to enabling the traffic to properly traverse and be managed by the SDC. I wouldn't go without any of these. They're all really important and they complement the security pieces I've been talking about. So the SDC as a whole, um, a holistic view, if you will, says anything that I have to manage or process or enable for a service to be successful, I need to do at the session board of controller. All right, with that, um, I want to cover one more topic, and that's where are you going to deploy these SBCs? I've shown you some nice pictures of a network view, but haven't talked at all about deployments. So the SBC needs to be deployed wherever your VoIP infrastructure is. That's just about as simple as I can make it. So where is that going to be? Well, for Ribbon, we have appliance-based SBCs, and we have a software-only SBC that runs as a virtual machine. And those will be deployed in your network data center or in a private cloud if you have one implemented or that's the direction you're going in. Um, each of those that are deployed are going to be providing everything I just talked about right before, whether it's IP access traffic or whether it's network pairing traffic, right? What we'll do, what Ribbon will do, or one of our qualified partners will do, right, will be to install that equipment and help you get it turned up. And as the customer, you'll be responsible to manage the SBC application software. Um, in the case of the uh, software only SBC, the SBC suite, um, that can run uh, again on physical servers that are applied by us or could be provided by you. In the case of, of our customer providing servers to our specifications, then you'll be responsible for managing those servers. On a public cloud, which is another option, if that's a direction you want to go in the, today or in the future, 
right? Uh, we'll support our software-only SBC being deployed in, in AWS, um, in Google Cloud, and in Azure. So while the implementation services would still come from Ribbon or a qualified partner, uh, you as the customer would be responsible to manage the SPC application. Whereas the cloud resources for the server infrastructure and all the network connectivity is going to come from the public cloud provider. So with that, let me go ahead and summarize. Uh, I've been talking for about a half hour straight. Um, VoIP networks and services are attack vectors. They will be exploited by bad actors. Um, malicious attacks will happen. They'll happen at multiple layers. You need an answer, and SBCs are the right solution for this. Something net, network, next generation gateway firewall, wow, next generation firewalls will not do successfully. And um, those SBCs are gonna be wherever you wanna put them. And we have a portfolio expertise and experience I think you guys will require um, to ensure that VoIP is not a security risk in your network. So with that, um, if there are any questions, I will open it up. Lance, do we have any uh, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, we did have a couple. Um, so we'll just start with this one here. And by the way, while we're going through these, uh, please feel free to, to go ahead and type your questions in. We'll have a few more minutes to, to take a look at those. Um, first question is, you describe SBC use cases in the IP access and IP peering domains. And your network diagram show two different SBCs for these two domains. Are, am I required to use two different SBCs for these two purposes? That's the question. Not at all. Um, again, it depends on your network topology. It depends on your traffic rates. But um, session border controllers can handle signaling and media in both of those domains. Um, there are some different configurations. There may be some different features that you can enable on one versus the other. Uh, but you do not need two SBCs. Um, again, it's entirely up to, to your network topology and how much traffic you have as to what you would like to deploy. Okay, very good. Um, does an SBC actually stop a distributed denial of service attack? That's an interesting way to ask that question. Um, no, the bad actor is gonna keep attacking as, as much as they can. Um, until they realize that they're being unsuccessful and they will stop. So it doesn't actually force them to stop until they see some behavior, which is lack of success. Having said that, the SBC is absolutely mitigating that attack, preventing that attack from causing disruption in your network to the services you provide. And so it is, it is making it a challenge and stopping the bad actor from being successful. And bad actors have no, no motivation if they're not successful and they'll move on to another target. Or they'll change their tactics um, and try something different. Again, hopefully all of that is being protected at both the application layer and at the uh, IP layers to, uh, to stop different adaptable attacks. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and this is the last question I'm seeing here. It's a, it's from a small, small carrier, small operator. Um, and they would like to know, since they are a small operator, isn't their risk pretty low for, for bad actors? Um, well, sure. You may not be the, the first, the first uh, attack vector on their list. However, having said that, um, I'll use an analogy. Um, I, I maintain my car, right? I, I want the brakes to be good so I can stop on time. I want the right air pressure in my tires so um, I have good handling. Um, I wear a seatbelt because it's safe. I, I do these things not because I fear my car is going to fail me, but because they're good practices. So while you may not think that you're an attack vector, um, if you have uh, businesses behind you that could be hacked. You don't know that, and they can, you can be attacked. You can be attacked directly. Um, these are the SBC is a best practice. It is a, I'll say it's a requirement. I mean, you won't pass inspection with your car if you if you don't have enough air in your tires or or your brakes don't work or they fail, right? So, 
there's a goal here of having the right infrastructure so that you know that you're protected against those attacks. I would venture to say, if you never got attacked, that would be phenomenal. Uh, but I certainly couldn't tell you that, and I don't think you want to take that risk, even as a small operator. Yeah, better, better to be safe than sorry, for sure. Um, all right, well, that's, that's all the questions I have. Um, any final comments, Dan, before I wrap it up? And um, I hope this has been useful. Uh, I hope you've learned something new. And um, again, if, if you believe that um, IP trunks, VoIP traffic are in your future, and especially if you are going to be um, meeting the stir shaking mandate later on in 2023, um, you're going to need an SBC. Give Ribbon a call. Very good. Well, um, with that, we're going to go ahead and close things out today. I do want to remind everybody on the call still, uh, if you haven't yet signed up for the Ribbon Tech Forum, highly encourage you to do that. That's going to be here in Dallas at the uh, Weston Galleria, um, really nice venue, really nice part of Dallas and a really great time of year to be in Dallas with cooler weather. Um, and that's gonna be November 2nd through the 4th, I believe, is that correct, Dan? With a golf yes, tournament, I believe, that, on the 1st? Yeah, that is correct. And, and by the way, um, Lance, we did have one more question come in okay. um, around rules of thumb for estimating uh, VoIP traffic volumes based on the quantity of end users. Um, and I'll tell you that we, we actually spent a lot of time looking at this um, as we're sizing and engineering networks for our customers. Um, I would say there's no perfect answer, but generally for residential subscribers, we, we assume about three CCS per subscriber. And for business, traditionally we've done about six and we'll, we'll engineer that. So it, it really, if you, if you use the three CA, Three CCS engineering value that comes to about a 10 to 1 um, session to user ratio. So if you have 100 uh, users, you can expect to have about 10 sessions. Um, we then generally apply a peak and mix factor of about 20% to engineer that the network to handle that. So if you um, if you bump that up by by 20%, generally that's the the max number of sessions that you should expect to see um in like a uh you know a busy uh, the busy seconds within the busy hour and let me add one other point on that so and, and i think this is really important you're engineering your session board controller for the traffic levels you expect with some overhead as jamie just identified but the spc itself is engineered to stop much more traffic than that when you get an attack so um, you, you're not, you don't have to engineer it for the attack level. You're engineering it for your traffic busy hour levels, but the SBC is built to stop these, these attacks that can come in at high volumes. And I think that's really important point. I probably should have pointed that earlier. earlier. Thanks, thanks for uh, seeing that one, Jamie. It's sneaked in there under the radar. Um, so yeah, so thanks everyone for, for the for the questions. Again, uh, later today you're going to get an email with the replay to this entire presentation. If you think of a question after watching it, or you just think of something later, reply to that email, and I'll get that in my inbox, and I'll make sure Dan and Jamie get a hold of it and can get back to you very quickly. Uh, but we'll have the the replay sent to you later today, as well as a, a copy of these slides. So um, we appreciate your attendance today. Please check out uh, our website for more details and uh, check out the Tech Forum event, as I mentioned, November 2nd through the 4th. Uh, and if you come in a day early, there's a really great uh, golf tournament going on on the 1st. So we hope to see you all there. Thanks so much for your time today, and we'll talk to you soon.